participated in an interfaith peace service, prayer service for peace on Wednesday, down at Cabrini. I did it last year, too. It was in October last year. Uh, I don't know why we moved it up to July this year. It's a lot hotter. But this is a good week to be praying for peace. And throughout the week, as I was reflecting both on our scripture passages this morning and then also the material I was preparing for this peace service, my heart and my mind kept coming back to fear and courage. And here in this story of John the Baptist, I don't know if you caught it towards the beginning, but there is a question there here about fear. It says that Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and so he, Herod, protected him. His wife Herodias, yes, his daughter is also named Herodias, which can be confusing, but his wife, Herodias, wanted John to be executed because he'd been prophetically telling Herod, uh, it's unlawful for you to be married to your brother's wife. She fostered this deep grudge against him and wanted him gone. Now, when it says that Herod feared John, I think it really means more that Herod feared the possible divine consequences that might come from hurting John. It was more that Herod feared John's God than Herod feared John himself. You see, if he had a blessing or a favor of a god, then to bring him harm would be divi invite divine retribution. And this worldview wouldn't have been too uncommon back then, and honestly, it's not that uncommon today, still. There are still all sorts of folks who think, on some level, that to do right or wrong by a priest or pastor is to curry either favor or retribution from the god that they represent and serve. And I suspect that those folks are generally more inclined towards a fearful disposition towards God overall. Uh, you don't need to think of me that way. <laughs> but as I've thought about fear, right, I, I went to do a little bit of research, and I found an interesting study from 2015 a meta-analysis study of a whole bunch of different uh, psychological and social studies that have been done over the uh, last couple of years that uh, from the National Institute of Health. And they were trying to ask this question of whether appeals based on fear were effective in helping people change their behavior. You know, like your health is going to go downhill if you don't do X, Y, Z. Is that effective or not? And what they found is that, uh, namely, two propositions were true, that, that actually fear-based appeals are helpful. They do work uh, under two conditions. Um, the first being, basically, if we're all susceptible, if there's a high susceptibility to a, to a disease, but it's kind of low risk, People will change their behavior, but maybe not their attitude. You know, they'll kind of be begrudging about what they're doing. The other proposal proposition that they found support for was that when there's a high susceptibility and high risk, and we all experienced this during COVID, uh, people are, based on that fear, uh, more likely to change their attitudes, their intentions, and also their behavior. So the whole orientation towards, uh, towards vaccination, for example, you know, we might change our orientation towards that. But the major caveat to all of this, which is why I tell this to you, is like on one hand, the study says, yes, fear works. But the major caveat to this is that they found that almost all of this effectiveness related to one-time events and not repeated behaviors. So here's the quote from the study. Persuasive messages should be more successful when they recommend one-time behaviors, for example, getting vaccinated, 
compared to behaviors that must be repeated over an extended period of time, for example, exercising. As it takes less effort to do something once than many times, people are likely to be more compliant when a single behavior is recommended. This kind of makes sense, right? Fear works, but kind of as a one-off thing. I found another similar study related to this that was examining uh, positive reinforcement versus negative reinforcement. And what they found was, yeah, negative reinforcement can work in conjunction with positive reinforcement, but what we find is that it tends to have destructive side effects. You get the behavior that you want, but then there are some unintended destructive side effects. So overall, the positive reinforcement is probably better. Now, I offer that to you in the context of this Herod story because I think there's something interesting here to be said about his fear of John, his fear of divine retribution, because it was probably more on that one off, that one time side of the spectrum. Which is actually, by that I mean his fear of John, his fear of John's God was something that was tested over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, and therefore had diminishing returns. Every time his wife came to him, every time she'd try to enact her grudge, Herod's fear became a little less effective in preventing him from indulging her wish. Moreover, the story seems to come to a head when he is presented with a viable excuse, a justification, a way to rationalize uh, this behavior, this act, rationalize his fear away, because it's really someone else who has forced him to do this. He didn't want to, but his daughter had performed her duty so well, and he wanted to reward her, and that's just what she asked for. Well, it's not really on me, is it? Herod may have asked himself, clearly I don't want to do this, but my hands are tied. As the scriptures record, the king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. And so in that moment, his fear of John, his fear of John's God was overcome, and John's life and ministry were brought to a close. And I'll leave for another time the disconcerting reality that Herod felt freed from this act, from this responsibility, because it had been displaced onto his daughter. As with Pilate, Pontius Pilate's later proclamation regarding Jesus' death, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I'm innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. This is what we do with fear. And I share this with you because it is an unfortunate truth that elements of the church have occasionally flirted with fear as a means to promote conversion, and also behavioral compliance. Perhaps it is a present fear of God's retribution, like Herod's, or a fear of a future punishment for not following the rules, or perhaps even fear of pastors and priests, which admittedly is not wholly unmerited. Church attendance as a whole does tend to briefly spike numerically when a great natural disaster or national tragedy happens briefly, and then once the fear passes, things return to the way that they were before the crisis. And that's probably as it should be, because fear is not actually a good motivator for positive long-term behavioral change. That's the point of the studies, right, that I offer to you. Fear is not actually a good motivator for positive long-term behavioral change, and it's not a good, holy, or sustainable basis for discipleship let alone church growth. Fear might get you some quick results, but it does not grow a healthy church. And, you know, in the first chapter of 2 Timothy, which is a passage that I'm sure you're familiar with, even if it doesn't immediately come to mind, well, it tells us that fear is the exact opposite of God, what God wants for us. Here, here's what it says. This is Paul writing to Timothy, I'm grateful to God 
whom I worship with a clear conscience as my ancestors did, when I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day, recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. Oh, there's that word. I am reminded of your sincere faith. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying out of my hands, for God did not give us a spirit of fear, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. As I was reading that this morning, I, I really thought to myself, this could be the motto for Methodism. Power, love, and self-discipline. Church, we're living through a time of great fear. We've been in it for a season. We're still coming out of a global pandemic. The economy is uncertain. Political strife is on the rise. And when we sow fear, we reap division and violence. And yet, let me be clear, there is no room in the United Methodist Church. I feel like I can speak for the United Methodist Church. I'd like to say there's no room in Christianity. I hope that's true. There is no room in the church for political violence. We've been anti-terror from the very beginning, and I have no intention of stopping now. We renounce the spirit of fear in any and all forms. And I encourage you to take up the Holy Spirit as children of God, dedicated to lives of worship and service. Or as our Ephesians passage concluded, in Christ you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people for the praise of his glory. And what is that Holy Spirit? It's not the spirit of fear. It's the spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. Now, obviously, I'm referring to the events of yesterday. I'm not going to belabor it. But I knew all week, I, God had been speaking to me all week about fear and the necessity of courage. And the first thing I heard when I showed up this morning at Aldersgate, having prepared this sermon as I walked in, before I'd even got to the sanctuary, I popped in to say hello to the folks who were in the kitchen, and they just said, we are afraid. How tiny. We are afraid. There's reasons to be afraid. And yet that is not what God has intended for us. We are a people of hope and compassion and mercy and forgiveness. But we are not a people of fear. And I don't think we want to reap the harvest of that emotion and affect. So I would invite you this morning to be people who are overcome not by fear, but filled with the spirit of power and love and self-discipline be filled with the Holy Spirit so that we can make God's kingdom here, regardless of what happens outside of these walls.